All right, welcome to the Argue With Me podcast. I see Michael just jumping forward like he wants to say, welcome to the Rational Egoist. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we have Mike Humer uh, with us as well. And Mike uh, has been on this podcast, uh, both podcasts previously, I should say. He's the uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Michael, for his listeners, will require no... Um, I'm going to use this convention, by the way, where when I'm referring to Michael Humer, I'm going to say Mike. When I'm referring to Michael Leibowitz, I'm going to say Michael. So uh, for the listeners uh, uh, to know what's happening, especially if you don't have video. So um, Michael Leibowitz is the host of The Rational Egoist, which will come as no surprise to probably 80% of the audience listening to this. <laughs> and of course, I'm the, uh, Jerry Bordeaux, the host for uh, the Argue With Me podcast. And I'm really excited about today. I've got uh, two great guests who have agreed to uh, have a debate. I should say this, this debate will be semi-formal. So we are going to have opening statements and rebuttals and questions and uh, that sort of thing, and a closing statement. Um, however, I'm not going to be sitting on a stopwatch um, and, and yelling at anybody if they go a little over uh, time. I want this to be a fulsome discussion, if I could put it that way. And I trust these two guys are able to govern themselves mostly. I'm not going to take a position in anything. I'll explain the resolution in one second. Uh, I'm just going to be here as the moderator and uh, tech support if required. Hopefully it's not because I'm not very good at that. <laughs> it's, uh, so let's get into it. Um, resolution. Minarchism is better than anarcho-capitalism. And on the uh, uh, positive side, going uh, in the affirmative for the resolution, is Michael. So, Michael, I'm going to let you, you have the floor. You can go ahead with your opening statement. Well, first of all, Jerry and Mike, thank you both a lot for doing this. I, I appreciate it. I think it's going to be a great discussion. So, according to a prominent philosopher, the foundational problem of political philosophy is what is the basis for political authority? And he says, this question is two parts. One, what entitles the state to forcibly impose laws on the rest of us and force us to pay for their services? And he calls this the problem of political legitimacy. And the second question, which he calls the problem of political obligation, is why should we obey the state? I would... Uh, replace these questions. And I would say the first question should be, are there any circumstances under which a state could legitimately maintain a monopoly on retaliatory force? And I would replace question two with, are there any circumstances under which we are obligated to obey the state? Now, ultimately, I think that both Mike and I would agree that individual rights are paramount. So this is a debate ultimately about the best way to protect individual rights. Now, I contend that the security of such rights requires objective laws that apply equally to all and are readily accessible to the public. People need to know the rules of the game. I don't think this is possible when there's no overriding authority where different protection agencies compete in the same geographic area. You know, different people want different rules and they'll sign up for agencies that have forced those rules. I could lay out probably an abundance of scenarios to illustrate this point, but I'll stick to two. The first one is suppose you have an 18 year old guy and he's dating a 17 year old girl and they have sex. According to his protection agency, this is perfectly fine. According to her parents' protection agency, it's a felony. His parents find out they're having sex and report it. How can you resolve this when you have two separate agencies? A another example would be, what if you have an agency that protects intellectual property, protects copyright laws, and another agency that doesn't, that thinks that such laws are unjust? A guy who has the first protections agency writes songs. These songs are valuable. A woman with the second protective agency gets a hold of these songs and sells them. How do you resolve this? Ultimately, under anarcho-capitalism, there's no final arbiter to resolve such disputes. Without such an arbiter, these disputes can go on in perpetuity. This is especially problematic, I would say, when they're the disputants are governed by different laws. Also, when you have competing defense agencies in a given geographic area, you're going to lack a central authority that's going to provide a military. Without a military, you're subject to invasion. 
and the, the, and the, the invasion would be rather tempting especially if the anarcho-capitalist society creates a prosperous society, a powerful state will have every incentive to invade. In reality, I don't know how an anarcho-capitalist system could even prevent criminal organizations from coming into being that could compete with it. Now, a proper government faces none of these issues. It legislates, publishes, and enforces laws equally to on everyone in a given geographic area. It serves as a final arbiter and it provides a national defense. By proper government, I mean one that protects the individual rights of the, its citizens. And it also does not initiate force against its citizens by, for instance, taxing them. Now, a, a common argument made by anarcho-capitalists is that such a government, if it was limited to protecting individual rights, would be precluded from preventing protection agencies from rising up. I disagree with that, and I disagree because of what we may call the risk principle. By this, I mean that a government that is limited to protecting individual rights it can justifiably pass laws against behaviors that don't in and of themselves violate rights, but create such a risk of violating rights that it warrants their uh, exclusion from society. For instance, we have drunk driving laws, which I think are justifiable. Somebody that drives drunk doesn't necessarily violate the rights of somebody else, but there's a high risk that they will by crashing into somebody, for instance. Or, for instance, somebody that shoots off guns randomly in the air in all directions. It, it, the bullets may not hit anybody, but there's a risk that they will, so that justifies them being outlawed. Similarly with protective agencies. If you've already got a government that's protecting individual rights and an agency wants to rise up, if it gets powerful enough, there's a severe risk that it will violate rights. So it's justifiable to outlaw it. So let me return to the questions that I started with. I would say that the circumstances under which a, a state can legitimately maintain a monopoly on retaliatory force is when it is limited to the protection of individual rights. And I think that we are only ob obligated to obey a state when, a, when it asks us not to violate the rights of others. And with that, I turn it over to you, Jerry. Okay, great. Um... I know that this is not uh, uh, time for questions, but uh, just want to make sure for listeners' uh, sake, um, Michael, I, I thought I really liked your opening statement. It's brought up a lot of live issues. I'm sure we can get into after. I should note that uh, Mike and Michael did not know what either one was going to say at the start of this, um, although I suspect Michael has uh, uh, easier ways of finding out what Mike humor would say. <laughs> um but uh, I did want to ask you, uh, Michael, just, just for definitional purposes, um, uh, minarchism to you then, and don't let me put words in your mouth, is that just defense and police or can you can you just define I, minarchism? I would, I would ultimately say it's what I think Robert knows it called the night watch in state. Okay. I think that, that it ultimately is limited to protecting rights. Yes, police to, to enforce laws locally, military for national defense. And of course, you're going to need courts of law to resolve disputes. Okay. That, perfect. by the way, is not my formulation. I got it from Ayn Rand, which I'm, I'm sure Mike is, is familiar with. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that any listener knew what we were even talking about. Uh, uh, so with that, um, I will turn it over to Mike Humer uh, for your opening statement. Right, thank you. Uh, so I have a little slideshow that I'm going to try to share here, and I guess um, you know some of the listeners will have video, and maybe maybe not all of them will. Anyway, so so it's a brief slideshow. I'm just going to talk through this. Um, yeah, this is all working, right? You're all seeing that. Okay, so now I'm going to start, you know, somewhat inappropriately with what's wrong with um, having debates and, you know, why debates are not a good way to learn about things. But don't worry, I'm going to continue to do it anyway, even though it's not a good way to learn about issues. Mike, and first... I, I'm sorry for cutting you off. Uh, yeah. uh, um, I, I don't. I just want to make sure this is what you intend to show. There's a, uh, I can see the slide, what's wrong with debates, but it's not popping up exactly the same as it was prior. Uh, Michael, is it looking the same way to you or does it look normal on your screen? Um, um it, it i don't know what normal would be okay so, so for example i, I can know. see a i can see a pane that says no notes uh, i normal see that also yeah oh. so so if you have notes okay, that are like trade secrets i just right, don't want me... you to 
<laughs> Wait, let me try something else. Is it, is that the same? Perfect. That's, that's where you want to be. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, good. No, there weren't any notes anyway, but you know, <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, so this is what's wrong with debates. Uh, you know, first, um, you know, the, the two parties generally don't, you don't get the person's full case because you don't have time to present your full case. Right. So like, you know, my, my argument for anarcho-capitalism is in a book, right? It's called The Problem of Political Authority, which is, how long is it? So it's more than 300 pages. And I cannot present, you know, the content of a book in 10 minutes. I, I can't do that. There's no responsible way of attempting to do that. So you just can't present your, your real case. And then the second thing that's wrong is, well, you don't get people's considered responses. Because, you know, the person gives their argument, then the other person has to respond with the first thing that they think of, because they have to respond right now. So they can't give the fully considered response that they would give if they thought about it for a day or something. Uh, another another thing is just with verbal conversations in general, it's common for people to be talking past each other and not understanding each other. It's common for somebody to overlook something that another person said or just forget to respond to a point. So, you know, like if um, if Michael makes uh, three arguments, a common thing to ha to happen would be like I start responding to the first one, and then, and by the time I'm done with that, I've forgotten the second one, and and then I and then it, I just never address it because I forgot to address it. Now that wouldn't happen in a written exchange. And then another problem is um, there's no time to fact check. So a thing that commonly happens is the other person makes an empirical claim, and you hear that and you and you think you don't think that it's true but you don't have time to go fact check it and like find out, you know, find out on the internet what people are saying about that thing. So anyway, so that's why, um, you know, it's better to read books, okay? And so I recommend reading this book, The Problem of Political Authority. <laughs> that's just another plug for my book there, but it's good. Okay, anyway. Oh, wait, sorry, let's go back. Um, okay, so yeah, all right. So this is just some background that I'm assuming because I don't have time to give a case for libertarianism. I'm just going to assume that we're all libertarians here, you know, which probably probably is mostly true, all right? And also, I'm going to assume that you know what minarchism and anarcho-capitalism are because I don't have time to to you know, explain all the background. If you don't, then I recommend you know stopping the podcast and going and reading one of these books. Okay, you could read my book, but it doesn't have to be me. You know, there's also like David Friedman's Machinery Freedom or Murray Rothbard's For New Liberty. Uh, and that will tell you what anarcho-capitalism is and give you basic theory, which, you know, which I don't really have time to go into here. So I'm just going to assume, you know, we're all libertarians and we just want to know which form of libertarianism is better. Um, minarchism or minimal state libertarianism or anarchism, otherwise known as anarcho-capitalism. Okay, and um, uh, you know, background protection by protection services, I mean basically the services that the state should provide according to the minarchists, and that's you know basically as we were saying a minute ago, uh, protection of individual rights, protection of your negative rights against force and fraud. So that would include having a police force, having courts, you know, maybe having jails or something to punish the criminals, whatever you think is the appropriate thing to do to criminals. It will be some, some people to do that. Uh, and you can have a military to protect against rights violations by foreign governments. Okay. So, all right. So, you know, whatever the minarchist thinks we should do, I call that protection services. Minarchism, I take it, holds these two views. There should be an organization that provides protection services. That's the first thing. And secondly, they think that that organization should forcibly prohibit others from providing protection services. Right. Okay. So I think uh, I think this view is not true because I think you know it can't be that both of those are true. All right. So you know here's the here's my first argument, kind of briefly. Um, it's wrong to initiate force against someone who isn't doing or threatening to do anything wrong. And I take that to be common ground among libertarians. And so whether you're a minarchist or an anarcho-capitalist, you probably accept that, uh, you know, if you if you accept rights in general. Okay, and then, um, so protection services are either wrong or not wrong. If it's wrong to provide protection services, then minarchism is false because part A is false, right? There shouldn't be an organization doing that thing that's wrong. Uh, but if it's not wrong to provide protection services, then minarchism is false because part B is false. It would be wrong to prohibit others from providing them. 
Because if providing protection services isn't wrong, then by stopping other people from doing it, the government is initiating force against people who haven't done anything wrong and are not threatening to do anything wrong. Okay, so either way, minarchism is false. Either part A or part B is false. And I rather think it's part B. Okay, that was that. Okay, this is my second argument. All right, so the first argument is supposed to appeal to, you know, rights-based libertarians, people who are libertarian because they believe um, it's required by our natural rights. And the second argument is supposed to um, appeal to economic-based libertarians. These are people who think that libertarianism is more economically efficient, you know, promotes utility more or something like that. All right, so first, uh, capitalism is better than socialism, which all libertarians agree on. And furthermore, there are specific reasons that I think all or nearly all libertarians agree on as to why capitalism is better than socialism. All right, so first, that um, voluntary exchange is good. Voluntariness is better than coercion in general. So if you have a voluntary transaction between two people, um, that will typically benefit both parties. More precisely, in a voluntary transaction, both parties um, typically normally, unless there's something, you know, unless unless they're crazy or something, but, you know, normally uh, both parties anticipate that their goals will be furthered by that transaction. And, uh, and you know, what this has to do with capitalism versus socialism is that the socialists uh, want to interfere with voluntary transactions. And they also like, you know, impose impose constraints on transactions that the two parties in the transaction don't agree to. Okay, and the problem is, well, when you have non-voluntary transactions, then you can get things that don't benefit both parties. You can even get things all, you know, lower utility that that harm one person more than they benefit the other. Right. And, you know, when the government is interfering in the market economy, they prevent people from making voluntary transactions. So they prevent people from realizing benefits that could benefit everyone involved. Okay, second thing is uh, the benefits of competition versus monopoly. So competition tends to bring out the best. Um, it tends to make people try their best. So because there's competition in most industries, the businesses in each industry try to provide the best, the best product. If you have a monopoly, then you get problems with, um, you know, prices tend to get too high. Uh, you get quality problems. So like the quality of the product tends to deteriorate. You have supply problems, as in there tend to be shortages. Uh, and also speed problems, okay? And all of those problems occur when the government is providing products. And so we saw these things happen in the communist countries in the 20th century. And of course, there's still a few communist countries left. I'm reminded of this joke that Ronald Reagan once told, okay? So, so he's, um, maybe he was at a press conference or something. I don't know. He's telling this joke and he says, um, you know, there's this uh, Russian citizen who goes to a car dealer and you know he goes to to buy a new car and the car dealer shows him the cars and like tells him all about them and then at the end the customer says okay well i'd like to buy this car and the dealer says okay sure so um we can deliver that to you in five years um, and the customer goes okay yeah of course <laughs> um are you going to come in the morning or the afternoon and so the dealer says well you know it's five years from now. What do you care if it's morning or afternoon? And the customer says, well, the plumber is coming in the morning. All right. So, so anyway, that's how things were in the communist countries. And why? Because the government is providing all services. They're a monopoly. Care if they lose customers. Okay. So like, you know, they could make you wait for a really long time. Uh, there were regularly shortages. So actually they didn't have problems with the prices being too high. They had problems with, you know, because the government would think, oh, no, we got to keep the prices down. But then you go to the store and they don't have the things that you want. So you go there and there's like, there's no bread. Right? And, um, and why? Because the government doesn't care. Because they don't have to worry about losing you as a customer because they're the only provider, right? And because they could just force you to keep paying them. All right. Anyway, so, okay, that's the problem with socialism. Okay, and this is my second major premise. Um, these same points apply to protection services. So, um, you know, voluntariness versus coercion, competition versus monopoly. The reasons why voluntary competitive systems are better apply also to protection services. Okay. And then, so, you know, just theoretically, there's no reason why these things wouldn't be true about protection. But also, if you just look at 
the empirical world, so to speak, uh, it appears that we are suffering from these problems because we have monopoly provision, right? So the government has monopolized the protection industry, and we see similar problems to the problems that happened in the socialist countries with all the other industries. So uh, actually, prices are too high, That which, you know, as I said, didn't really happen in the communist countries, but that's happening here. So the price of government just keeps going up. You know, they, they are spending something like... Um, I don't know, you like 40% of your income or something going to the government, you know, you, you get crazy things like that happening. Uh, we also have quality problems. So, um, you know, like the vast majority of crimes go unsolved. Um, so the government actually, they actually care about murders. So most murders get solved, but most other crimes don't get solved, right? And so, you know, like the vast majority of property crimes, which are most of the crimes, they never get solved, so they never punish anyone, right? There are parts of the parts of the country where you know, just in inner cities, where they're just crime prone all the time, and like there's not enough cops patrolling them, right? So that's a problem with quality and a problem with supply of protection, so to speak. Uh, and then there's you know these problems with being really slow. So you you bring a court case, or you're somebody brings a court case against you, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case. You can wind up in court for months or even years, you know. So you have these things where, like, there's some case running through the courts for like five years or something in order to resolve the dispute, and that's not unheard of. Okay. Oh, why is that happening? Probably the same reason why the government was doing a terrible job with everything else in the socialist countries, right? Because they have a coercive monopoly, so they don't have to worry about losing customers. And so the government just doesn't care. Like, you know, you get fed up with a court system. Well, too bad. You still you still have to use that system, right? And you know, you get fed up with paying too much money for these services. Too bad. We're just gonna force you to keep paying. So what do they care, right? And why do they care about solving crimes and you know making sure that most of the criminals get punished? Because, you know, if you're unhappy with a service, you have no one else to turn to. If you try to turn to someone else, well, we're just going to shut them down. So Okay, so at least prima facie protection services should be privatized. All right, now, so that doesn't completely prove that protection services could be should be privatized because you know maybe there's some important difference between protection services and all the other goods and services in the economy that I haven't thought of, or you know, or maybe I have thought of it. And I just haven't. <laughs> well, anyway, um, that I think that just sort of shifts the burden onto the minarchist to explain why protection services are different and the things that apply to other other industries wouldn't apply here. Okay, uh, that's all I have. So that's good. All I'm right, just stop the screen share now. All right, thanks, Mike, um, for going through that. Uh, so the next portion of this, then, and uh, plenty of time for it. Michael, your rebuttal. You get you get the first go. Well, first of all, I, I wouldn't say that uh, under the system that I'm advocating that we wouldn't allow any protection agencies to come about. And there there would be there of course would be private security if people wanted it. What we couldn't allow is an organization to get so powerful as to compete with the central authority. So that that that's the first thing. Secondly, the idea that minarchists are caught in some kind of a contradiction when it comes to the initiation of force. First of all, I think I explained that uh, you know away with the, the risk principle. But secondly, anarchists are in the same boat because suppose that we do have the anarchist society, but also then suppose that one agency is so much better than all the rest that it grows and grows and grows and then threatens to become a state. Either anarchists can stop that from happening in which case they're doing the same thing. They're using force to stop what they see as the bigger threat, or they allow it to happen and anarchy goes away. There's also this, you know, where the uh, government is overspending. I agree. The problem is government is giving people what they want. People want Social Security. They want Medicare. They want the government to be engaging in all types of things that I wouldn't support. For instance, a minimum wage law, I think is absurd, but most people want that. So that's where you end up having, you know, this over cost. Finally, it's true 
yes, that, that competition is generally a good thing. Freedom of competition is great. That might, however, be a problem for the anarchist. And here's why. Ultimately, where there's a demand for something, somebody steps in to meet that demand with the supply, right? So under this system, why wouldn't it happen that somebody wants a, a protect, protection agency that's not going to be willy-nilly, or I shouldn't even use willy-nilly, that's going to be very reluctant to hand him or her over to another agency should that person violate the rights of somebody from another agency? It doesn't stretch uh, uh, credulity to think that an organization would rise up to provide such protection. We see that, for instance, with organized crime, with the mafia. You had wise guys that needed protection. They couldn't go to the police for it. So you had the black market rise up, produce the mafia, and offer them protection. So why wouldn't that happen under this system with criminal organizations and not even criminal organizations where they say, I'm going to protect you. I will not turn you over to another organization. You will not be subject to lawsuits from them for criminal penalties from them. We will protect you to the hilt. So that's a, a potential outcome of that competition. Finally, what I think I already said finally, but I'll say it again. Finally, what differentiates uh, a state, of, you know, from other organizations, from capitalism, is the monopoly on violence, the monopoly on retaliatory force that they have. If you don't have just one organization in a given geographic area with that, you end up with the possibility, not definitely it's going to happen. I'm sure we'll bring up Iceland at some point, but you certainly have the potential to have these groups go to war, especially if you have a case like I just mentioned, where one organization simply refuses to turn over its people. So that would be the difference. And that ends my response to Professor Hume. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Uh, okay, so I guess I want to respond to a few things from your first statement and then from your reply there. Um, so that you started out saying that, well, we have to have a uniform law and everyone has to know what the law is ahead of time. I guess these are two different things. Um, I agree that people should be able to know what the law is ahead of time, but I don't agree that it has to be uniform. Right. So like, uh, so, you know, it could be like when you go to different neighborhoods, there are different rules. That's fine. As long as it's possible to know the rules. And uh, I think it's OK if different rules apply to different people in society, as long as you know which ones apply to you then you can, you can plan your life, right? And so how would you know? Well, you sign up for a protection agency, right? And then, you know, they will, they will tell you what rules they recognize, and then you know that you have to follow those, right? Or, you know, they, they won't defend you. Uh, and then you might think, well, what if you get into a conflict with somebody with a, another protection agency? And, you know, the standard anarcho-capitalist response to this is, well, you and the other person have to go to a, an arbitration agency, so, uh, or the or the two uh, protection agencies have to go to third party arbitration. Okay, and so this is you know that they they go to a neutral arbiter, right? And there would be private companies that do this, which are which would be analogous to the courts today, except that they'd be competing, you know, private companies instead of a government monopoly. Uh, why would they do that? Because um, that's the most efficient way, right? Because so these are profit making businesses. The most economically efficient way, or the cheapest way of resolving disputes is not to go to war with each other. Um, cheapest way of resolving disputes, you know, with the that that doesn't interfere too much with your profit margins, is um, you know peacefully, right, through a neutral third party. Well, that's probably also what most customers would want. Um, okay, you might think, oh, okay, but you know, like, how is there going to be a body of law agreed upon, like what what rules would the arbitrators use? How would they resolve disputes? Uh, and now, you know, just if you think about it just a priori, you might think, oh, nobody will be able to agree. But we actually have some, some empirical evidence that's relevant to this. We have some experience, right? Which is we have experience with the common law. So it used to be that most law um, in you know, the US and England and English influenced countries was common law meaning that it was made by judges, not by legislators. And the way that came about was that people who had disputes would go to a judge, and then the judge would try to resolve the dispute 
you know, based upon his sense or based upon the community's sense of what was morally right. And then, uh, and you would look at what other judges had decided in similar cases in the past, and then you would generally try to resolve disputes in the same way, right? If he had a new case, um, or if he had new circumstances, then he would just decide according to what he thought was sort of like common sense morality or something like that. And then he would write down his rationale and then future judges would look at that. Okay, and it turned out that that actually did work, right? There was not total chaos and it's not, people are not radically different so that, you know, when you read a judge's decision, you think that's totally bonkers. Like actually when you read the decisions in these common law cases, or at least when I read them, I think, yeah, that, that is common sense actually. <laughs> like, um, and, and you're like, okay, so uh, it, it wasn't impossible for judges to agree. Um, but, you know, there could be some differences. Now, I want to um, address a couple of cases. So there's like um, Michael mentioned the, I don't know, the statutory rape case, I guess. You know, is it, what's the what's the age of consent? You know, is it is it 17 or 18 or whatever? Now, I'm not um, I'm not sure what would happen in the anarcho-capitalist society. Generally speaking, I think the rules would be more permissive than our society. So they would tend towards you know, sort of like the, the most permissive thing that normal people would think. And the reason I think that is that um, I think most people care more about protecting their own liberties than they do about interfering with other people's liberties. So there are a lot of people who would like to interfere with other people. But um, and so like in a democratic society, they might vote to do that. But um, they don't care about that as much as they do about protecting their own freedom of action, which means people would be willing to pay more to have their freedom protected than they would to get to interfere with other people's freedom. Okay, but the democratic society doesn't take that into account. You just vote. And so you just, so you just count the number of people who prefer one option over another. You don't count how much they care about it, right? So you can have, you know, like if a majority of people want to enslave a minority, they, if a majority of people have a slight preference for enslaving the minority, then they get to enslave the minority in a democratic system, right? And even though the minority has a really strong preference to not be enslaved. Uh, what about the case of copyright? Um, yeah, my guess is in an anarcho-capitalist society that copyright wouldn't be protected. It would not be. Uh, now, I'm, I don't necessarily think that that's the right result, but I don't think that's a totally insane result. Um, and the reason, the reason why I think it probably would not be is the same sort of thing that, well, basically like, um, in order to stop copyright violations, like you got to feel really strongly about it. <laughs> like I'm, I feel strongly enough about it that I'm willing to start violence to stop people from copying my book. Uh, and I feel like, no, <laughs> um, and, and that's sort of like the, sort of like the reason why what we normally think of as people's normal rights would get enforced. It's sort of like, um, like I feel really strongly about not having people break into my house. And although I might like to break into somebody else's house, I don't feel as strongly about that. <laughs> and so the rule is probably going to be, you know, nobody gets to break into people's house. <laughs> okay. So um, if there's somebody who's like copying my book in order to stop that, I have to feel strongly enough about it that I'm willing to go over there and forcibly stop him from doing that, right? And that is sort of like, you know, potentially initiating a violent conflict. All right, so uh, generally speaking, libertarian rules would probably be enforced. Um, okay, so, and you might think this is bad. So maybe we won't have copyright, maybe we won't have patent law. Um, but as I say, I'm not sure that that's the morally right result. I'm just saying, I think that that's what would happen. But although I'm not sure it's morally right, I don't think it's totally crazy either. So I don't think it's a disaster for society if we don't have intellectual property law. Um, okay. Um, what else? Oh, okay. So there's the risk principle. Um, so the, the reason why the state gets to prohibit you from providing protection services is allegedly that your behavior is risky. I don't understand how that's risky or more precisely, I don't understand how um, the competing protection agency providing government-like services is any more risky than the government providing those same services. Now, so, you know, imagine that the competing protection agency, they could be, you know, they could be using the same procedures that the government is using. 
Right. So like the government has a risk of punishing innocent people, given that they punish anyone for any crimes at all, there's a risk that they punish the innocent. OK, so why doesn't that mean that it's wrong for them to provide those services? Well, maybe you say, OK, well, they have some reliable procedure, like they have a jury trial and they have rules of evidence and all this to make sure that they're reasonably reliable. OK, well, then why can't the private protection agency have similar procedures that also reduce the risk? by the same amount. Like, so I don't see why just from the fact that they're competing with the dominant agency, they're more risky. Um, okay. Uh, what else? Oh, there's a concern that, you know, what if a protection agency in the anarcho-capitalist society starts to develop a monopoly? Um, would the anarcho-capitalist stop that? Um, so basically, there well, there would be no mechanism to stop that. Um, except the market, but there wouldn't be a central authority to stop somebody from monopolizing an industry. Um, and so, you know, what's the anarcho-capitalist response to that? Oh, like, oh, so then they could set up a state, you know, could set up a state, right? Well, the anarcho-capitalist response to that is just that uh, it's extremely unlikely that that would happen. You don't need a central authority to stop that from happening because it just isn't going to happen because it's extremely difficult to establish a monopoly in most industries unless you already have a government to enforce the monopoly. The main way that monopolies occur in a capitalist society is the government interfering and establishing the monopoly. Okay, now, I think there are a small number of industries that could have natural monopolies, but protection services are not one of them. All right, and so the, the reason, basically, the reason why it's difficult to establish monopolies in most industries is there's a most efficient size for a firm, um, and it's not the maximum size. And if you get a if your firm gets too large, it starts to become inefficient. And so that means that it becomes more difficult for you to compete with smaller firms. All right. Now, the most efficient size for a firm has to do with the fixed costs for entering the firm, for entering the industry. The larger the fixed costs are, the larger the most efficient size is. Okay. So like in the auto industry, the most efficient size is really large because um, uh, building an auto factory is expensive. It's like it's just this huge bunch of capital, okay? But for the protection agencies, um, the fixed costs are minimal. There's no huge fixed cost that you need to start a, a protection agency. You just need like you just need to hire some people and give them some guns or something and some training. Okay, so because the fixed cost is small, there would probably be a so the the most efficient size would probably be pretty small. So there would probably be an extremely large number of protection agencies. And so it would be extremely difficult to monopolize the, the industry. So we don't need to have a central authority to stop that from happening. OK, um, let's see. As to Michael's explanation for um, why the government is uh, overstepping its authority, so to speak, and why they're, why they're spending too much of our money is that the government is giving people what they want. But I didn't understand how this was a response to the problem. So yes, that's that's the reason why it's happening. And there's the problem with democracy, okay? That a majority of people might vote to violate the rights of a minority and actually even to violate their own rights. <laughs> they might vote to do that, but including the people who don't want their rights violated. So, okay, but so we we explain why it happens. I don't see how that solves the problem. Or there would be a problem under anarcho-capitalism because, like, you know, you should assume that the people in the anarcho-capitalist society are the same people, the same kind of preferences, right? But the thing is, like, if you're in a capitalist structure, it's harder to do that because there there isn't this institution that takes your votes and then, like, forcibly imposes what the majority of people voted for. Right. You have to like people sort of have to put up their money. Right. And so uh, so, you know, it's harder to do this thing where a majority of people want to impose an extreme cost on the minority. A proper government that only uh, it only enforces people's legitimate negative rights. Um, and I, I just think that, that this isn't a realistic thing, right? That is, in, in, it doesn't appear that there's ever been a proper government in that sense. Right? There's never been a government that only enforced people's rights according to a libertarian conception of that. And you might think, well, maybe someday in the future there will be one, but, um, you know, no, there probably won't because 
there are systematic explanations for why this is the case. It's not just an accident. It's not just like a couple of bad people in the U.S. government spoiled things. Uh, there are systematic reasons. So, um, you know, there's there's this phenomenon. And as I say, that the majority could just vote for something that benefits them but violates the rights of a minority. And they're just in the democratic system, there just isn't really incentives for people to decide rationally. So you're going to the polls and you know that there are millions of people voting. And so you know that your vote will not make a difference, right? Or more precisely, you know that there's you know, a probability of less than one in a million, maybe one in 10 million or something like that, that your vote will make a difference. And so in your entire life, almost certainly none of your votes will ever make a difference to anything. And so that means that from a sort of rational self-interest point of view, there's no point in your exerting any effort to make sure that you vote well. And there's, you know, and there's, there's, there's no point in doing any research. There's no point in even exerting the effort to think rationally and to correct your beliefs because it's not going to make any difference to the outcome. But then the same reasoning applies to all the other voters. And so then you have this thing where just like the majority of people are voting irrationally or in an ignorant way, and then you get bad policies from the government and there just isn't I just don't see any solution to that. All right. Uh, and so, yeah. Mike, uh, yeah. sorry, I, I, I hate to cut you off unless uh, I want to check in with Michael here just because uh, you've been going for a, a while, which is great. I've been uh, enjoying listening to you, but I also yeah. wanted to give Michael a chance to to go. Uh, uh, I, we're supposed to go into questions, but given the despair or like you know, the the difference in the amount of time you've both spoken, <laughs> um, Michael, did you want to say a few words about what Mike just said or? I do. The, the first thing was he gave an example where different neighborhoods have different laws. Well, if that's the case, if you have a neighborhood that has a law, well, now you have a central authority that operates in a geographic area. I don't see how that's different from government. It might be small government. It might be in a, a small area, but it's government nonetheless, regardless of what you call it. As far as the common law, at the beginning of uh, uh, Professor Humor of Mike's statement, he talked about how different agencies are going to have different laws. Common law evolved in the absence of legislation. So it's a different scenario. And also the common law was applicable over large swaths of geographic area. It wasn't a situation where different people who had different laws governing their behavior went to an arbitrator, right? They went to a, a, a to judges that were subject to the crown, if we're talking about in England, for instance. Uh, the risk principle, the reason why it's risky to allow a state to, or, or a uh, protection agency to grow is because different people have different beliefs about what should be done and about what should be forced on other people. So if you have a state that's already protecting individual rights, in one and another state is starting to rise up, the risk is that 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 organization is going to do what most organizations with power do, or, or most governments do, I should say, is violate rights. Because what you'd be talking about in essence is another government. Now, it's the, the relevance that it has that most people want the government to do with the things that the government does. My answer to that is the same as my answer to the claim that what I'm advocating is unrealistic. Ultimately, what a government does is responsive to what the majority in any population wants it to do. Even under dictatorships, ultimately a majority or, or something close to it has to acquiesce. Anarcho-capitalism is faced with the same problem that I'm faced with. It's not realistic right now either. In, in order for either anarcho-capitalism to come into existence or my minarchist state to come into existence, enough people are going to have to have a radical change in philosophy. So as far as I know, even if we go and get Iceland, the empirical facts are there's never been a ANCAP state that protected individual rights where everybody's individual rights were secure. So he's faced with the same problem. So that's really all that, uh, th that's my response to what Mike said. Okay, um, Mike, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond later if that's okay with you guys. Uh, um, I, 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 there's questions and we're gonna have discussion at the end of the questions. Um, and uh, there's also closing uh, statements too. So uh, Michael, I'm gonna let you go ahead 
and ask the first question. I'll give each of you three questions to each other. We'll alternate. So Michael, <laughs> okay. you can ask a question and then Michael answer it and you guys can discuss um, uh, after, before the next question is asked. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. That's fine with me. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, with, go ahead, Michael. Okay. Suppose I'm walking down the street and, and, you know, in my field of vision on somebody else's property, I see a crime taking place and I want to report it. Who do I report it to? Do I report it to my protective agency? Do I try to report it to the property owner's protective agency? What if the victim of the crime isn't the property owner? Do I report it to his agency? How would I even know who his agency is or who the property owner's agency is? And what if there's other people unbeknownst to me who are witnessing this crime and they want to report it? Who do they report it to? And what if, you know, you end up with a situation where you have five or six people report it to different agencies. They all show up. Well, who has the authority in that case to to stop this crime from happening or to apprehend the perpetrator? Yeah, so there would probably be a protection agency that applies to a particular piece of property. Uh, now, why why is this? Well, because most people who own some property don't want crimes occurring on their property, even if it's against someone else. So if you own a business, you don't want crimes occurring against your customers or you know whoever's, whoever's at your business any more than you want them occurring against you personally. Right. So you probably call the protection agency for that um, piece of property. And, um, you know, how, how do you know what the protection agency is? Well, like the people who own the property would probably like they would have an incentive to make it easy. Right. So, you know, like if there was a crime problem, then they would do something to try to make it um, easy to stop the crimes. Right. You know, maybe they would have a security guard. Or, you know, if they didn't, maybe they would have a sign that says, call this number if you see a crime or whatever. Right? And so, you know, just the point that, well, if the incentives are set up right, you know, somebody will probably solve the problem. Michael, you can, uh, you guys can discuss if there's anything more to say on that question. too. I just, I, I don't, I don't see that as realistic. And the reason why is because if I'm walking by a McDonald's, for instance, and somebody's outside that McDonald's getting mugged. And it, I, I want to report it immediately. I'm not looking around for signs. Who's my, who's their protection agency, that sort of thing. Or what if it's on somebody's private property? What if it's it, it, like, you know, I live in a neighborhood right now. Suppose I look out my window and I see a guy beating his wife, it, it, you know, in the property across the street. Well, what do I do in that situation? Who do, whom do I call? And you have 30 other neighbors, you know, roughly, I don't know, maybe I'm not exact, but I think you get my point, that could be looking out their windows as well. I mean, it, it, we just had this big snowstorm. People look out the window in the snowstorm and they see it as well. Who do they call? How do we all know who that person's protective agency is? And, it, yeah. and mind you, what if the property owner, the person who owns the house, is abusing his girlfriend who doesn't live at that house, who has a different protection agency? How do we resolve that? Right now, I just call 911 and I say, this is where the problem is. Yeah, this doesn't seem to me like a large problem. So like, you know, I would like to say like, this is a, this is a problem that has never occurred in my life. Right, so like, oh no, wait, no, that's not true. There, there was a time when I had to call the cops um, because of some, some guys on the street. Uh, okay, but so, you know, this is, this is not the main thing that happens. Like the main thing that happens uh, when there's a crime is that after the fact, somebody reports it. Anyway, but so, okay, but if you live in a high crime neighborhood, maybe you see crimes occurring at the time. Um, I mean, like usually people don't commit a crime in front of a whole bunch of other people. They just don't do that. So like usually, you know, it would be hidden and then the victim would report it after the fact, right? Or, you know, if, if, if there's a dead body, then the person who finds the body reports it. Okay, but... Anyway, you know, is there is there a way to find out whom you should report a crime to? Well, you know, luckily we're in the information age. You know, like everybody has a smartphone. You know, you could probably just look up who you should call. Probably, probably wouldn't take that long. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like that big of a problem. Okay, all right. Uh, why don't we now go to uh, Mike? Your first question for Michael. Oh. Uh, well, I'm not sure that I really have questions per se. <laughs> You don't have any questions at all? I, you know, I'm 
I can just let comments. Michael needle you with questions if you want. I can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure how that'll come off. It could look out and look like well, what a great job I'm doing, or it could look like I'm just this <laughs> yeah, jerk, yeah. jerk who keeps throwing out questions. But I've got but, more yeah. questions. If, if I well, can if I, I can yeah. ask a question too, if you want to, yeah, to Michael. Sure. I, I mean, okay. So I I think um, Mike pointed out that um, well, you've both said that in general uh, the the government will give to the masses what they're asking for um but mike pointed out that there's like sort of a second half to that equation which is that people are asking for things that they know they don't have to pay for themselves there's there's some kind of decoupling there right between um uh, what they want and what they would actually be able to get if they had to pay for it themselves um what's your answer to that like how does the how does that not get out of control in your version of the state well it's problematic but it's not a problem that's limited to my version it's problematic and how you would ever get to an ancap society as well ultimately you have to have a society where people don't want free stuff where they they want to work for themselves they want to do their own earning until you have that then neither my scenario nor mike's is realistic so I don't I don't disagree that it's a, a serious problem, but the problem lies in philosophy and the beliefs of people and the, what people want. But that has to change in order for society to change no matter what. And by the way, this type of thing isn't unprecedented in history where you, you've had enough people in society that have changed their minds to you know, significantly alter the course of that society, whether it be in, you know, during the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, the, you know, the the Velvet Revolution, the type of thing happens, the, the glorious revolution in England, although that was more of a reinstatement of previous things. But my point is that it does happen where there's a significant sea change in a given society where things can change. It's not common and it's by no means easy, but it's possible. Well, yeah, I mean, so I, I don't think that anarcho-capitalism faces the same problem. I mean, so there's a difference in incentive structures. So in like a democratic, democratic governed society, you know, there's there's an institution that's already set up with the like with the ability to just enforce whatever whatever the majority wants. And so like so it's it's like it's really easy. You can just go to the polls and vote to get other people's stuff. And like in the anarcho-capitalist society, there isn't any institution that's there to steal other people's money and give it to you. There's no like voting. There's no time when you're asked to put in your vote about whether you want to steal somebody's money. So even if you want to steal other people's money, you don't have a mechanism to do it, right? It's like the, like the reason why I think, anar you know, perhaps paradoxically sounding anarchy, anarchism is more feasible than limited government, right? Is that, um, the anarcho-capitalist theory doesn't require people to go against their interests. They, people could still be selfish. They could still want other people's stuff, but they just don't like having an easy mechanism for stealing it. Okay, uh, can I respond? Yeah, Jerry? yeah, go ahead, okay. Michael. Okay, uh, I'm not, my point was that in order to even get to an anarcho-capitalist society, you'd have to convince enough people of its viability. That that's where they face the same problem is that you in order to get to my state you have to convince enough people in order to get to the anarcho capitalist society you have to convince enough people, and I, I would just push back a little bit on the idea that there's no structures that would allow for people to loot others, because there'd be a significant risk of organized crime, especially when, when there's no power of state to stop it and people are allowed to sign up for their own protective agencies, <laughs> the mafia in essence is a protective agency. That protects criminals, and and what would be how can an anarchist state stop that? So yeah. I think there is the possibility for people who want to steal other people's money to get an organization that would do so. Even though that wasn't my point, my point had to do with how you get there to begin with. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. How how do you deal with the mafia and the organ criminal organizations? So, like, the main thing that I want to say is. Um, actually, the the main source of revenue for criminal organizations is um, vice crimes. So um, that is, they're selling things that they're selling products and services that the government has prohibited. Um, and so especially uh, recreational drugs. So recreational drug sales are the main source of 
um, revenue for criminal organizations. And the main the main thing that criminal organizations are about is trying to get money. I think that's the main thing that they want. The main way they're getting money is, you know, drugs, also like to a lesser extent prostitution and gambling. So it's stuff that the government has prohibited, which so they wouldn't be able to make any money in a really free market society. Um, I disagree, and I'll tell you why. I agree that crime would drop considerably if you legalize drugs, mostly because drug addicts would no longer have to steal to provide for their habits. But the people who are currently involved in drug dealing are not just suddenly going to go out of business. They're not going to say, oh, well, they took away our means of trade, how, you know, how we earn a living, so we're going to go legit, any more than the mafia suddenly went legit at the end of Prohibition. They find different ways to make money, even if that means extortion, robbery, that sort of thing, which in my view, it, that those types of crimes would be, you know, right for the taking in this society because there'd be no state large enough to stop them. Especially right. when you're talking about people that are, are absolutely ruthless, don't care about who they hurt at all. It, it's just, yeah. it's it's unrealistic to me that you could stop such an organization in, a, in an anarchist society. Well, but, um, so, so, you know, like when I say most of their revenues come from um, illegal drug sales, like, that's the empirical fact about the current status quo. Okay, so now mm -hmm. let's say, and so, you know, when, when you remove the drug laws, um, you know, it's not that they become nice. It's that they simply can't compete with normal businesses because they're not, they're not great business people. They're, they're just people who are good at evading the law. And so in a regime where the product is illegal, then they have an advantage. But if it's legal, then they don't have an advantage. They just get driven out by competition. And then you think, okay, but then they'll just go into some other business. Well, why are they not doing that other business right now? Like, you know, they're probably right now, they're probably trying to maximize their revenue, right? So they're probably doing, you know, what whatever they can do to get money for themselves. And it turns out that just by empirically observing them, it looks like what they can make the most money on is selling these products that uh, the government prohibited. Right. right. They're going to take the path of least resistance. But when you legalize drugs, you're taking away that path. So they're going to go to the next path of least resistance and well, so no, no, no. on and they so can... forth. So whatever the next path is, why aren't they already doing it? Because it's easier and more profitable to do it by means of drugs. But no, why aren't take... they... That's what I'm saying. If, if Because they're going to focus their energy where it's the, the easiest way to do it. The government has provided them, you, you know, with, with this large... Of, le of outlawing yeah. drugs. But once you legalize drugs, now then they're going to go to the next efficient thing, they're, which well, the, right now they're not doing because they can sell the drugs. But if you get rid of the drugs, they're going to say, okay, well, how can I keep up making money? What, what are some other areas? And those areas yeah. might be, you know, organized theft, robberies, extortion, which, by the way, the mafia has been involved in, you know, from time immemorial. And what put them out of business to a large extent was a, a large federal government that was willing to get creative with the laws. Well, and if you didn't do that, they would still be in business. But you're not going to have no, that mean, in an anarchist society. Well, no, so... They are still in business. <laughs> so there are still criminal organizations. And I'm I mean, talking specifically about the mafia. I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. but I wanted the, the mafia, the Italian mafia specifically yeah, yeah. is largely out of business. No, no, they're they're still operating in Sicily. <laughs> no, I'm talking about over here in America. <laughs> yeah, you're you're referring to the racketeering laws that uh Rico, like, yeah. yeah, that the government decided to bring in in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. But so um, you know, like I'm saying, well, okay, so things will just get a lot harder for the criminal organizations, right? Um, you know, um, and then, okay, well, what stops them from, you know, just like, uh, going around stealing people's money? Well, basically the protection agencies. Okay. Well, uh, all right. Well, why will the, why will the protection agencies stop them? Well, because people are willing to pay more to be, to have their rights protected than they're willing to pay to get to steal other people's stuff. And so, you know, like the, the benefit, so like the underlying economic fact is, um, with with most of the things that we consider crimes, the benefit to the criminal is smaller than the cost to the victim, which means that in principle, the victim is willing to pay more to stop the thing from happening than the perpetrator is willing to pay to make the thing happen. So like, that's why, that's the ultimate underlying reason why there's more, you know, in the free market, there's more pressure for protection 
of the rights than for violation of the rights. You see what I mean? So, Jerry, can I ask another question or do you want to ask a question? Um, I think where we left off, I had asked you a question, Michael, and then, Michael, you'd ask Mike a question. Uh, so I think it's back to uh, Mike. So, <laughs> Mike, it would be up to you to ask a question or up to me to ask Michael a question, but I'd prefer if you did. But <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I didn't I didn't really prepare questions. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, like, I don't know, I get I guess. I guess, you know, maybe I want to ask, like, you know, what do you what do you think is the solution to uh, the problem of voters who vote badly? You know, like because because they don't have an incentive to pay attention. Right. I, I think the solution ultimately is for. Well, I think it, 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 there's two things. One, make arguments for what types of society, what morality is better, which is, you know, what you do, what I, I do by having a podcast. So you try to change people's minds. And the other thing is when people get uncomfortable enough with a given society, they will come to say, okay, well, hopefully they'll say, well, this isn't working as just happened in Argentina, for instance, where they, they voted in this guy who I guess is an yeah. anarcho-capitalist. Uh, I don't know that we know their motivation for voting him in. I just know they voted him in, but I think that that's the solution. I'm not optimistic by any stretch of the imagination but yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes in life, there's just no solution here. I think there is. I think you can convince people. I think you can, you know, the society can become uncomfortable enough where people try something different. Do I think it's likely? Yeah. No, but that applies to what whatever system you're trying to implement. Okay, yeah, good. So, um, you know, maybe we can change people's general philosophical beliefs, you know, by, uh, you know, getting people to read my book. <laughs> but, uh, um, but I mean, I think there's a there's a sort of like further harder problem, right? Which is just sort of the everyday governance of society requires a lot of knowledge. So, like you know, it, even if you have the correct philosophy, like it were it requires a lot of work to find out whether a particular policy is good. You know, like when it, when Congress considers these bills they have these like multiple hundreds of pages long bills and so like you have to do huge research even in order to find out what yeah. the law says right and then so you know yeah and and then like well what's the incentive for people to do that research yeah i i don't know the answer ultimately i i think that that's why the government continues to grow and you know will continue to do so even the people out there right now that you hear screaming you know about how government's corrupt and all that but yet they support donald trump a lot of them who you know you know he calls himself tariff man he's won't cut entitlements he increases military spending and he wants to provide uh, paid family leave but yet his supporters think that they're somehow anti-government and it, it it's maddening to me as well i don't and i don't know other than making the arguments and hoping yeah yeah so I, you know, like I think it's it's not crazy that we might change people's general philosophical organization, um, philosophical orientation. But I think even if we do that, it's infeasible to get people to know details of many individual policies. You see what I mean? Like that's a harder yeah. problem. Well, I like, think certainly, for instance, we, we the war on drugs is an an abject failure. It's a gross violation of rights and it, it, it fails on every level. So say you, you can get people to see that. Something else like the minimum wage laws that, that just create unemployment amongst the people that you're, you're trying to help. Like there are some laws that we could show people. I think when it comes to foreign policy and who they're giving money to, that stuff's difficult because like who, who knows who they're giving money to? You know what I mean? What governments are they're subsidizing and wh where the troops are. All that stuff I think is far harder, but there's certainly some domestic policies I think that like taxes, are, are, do taxes help? Do higher tax rates actually help? Does socialized health care help? And I would say, no, they don't. And they're also rights violations. So if you get people to see that government ought to be protecting individual rights, there's a, a whole slew of things that I think that we could solve. Not easy, of course, but I think it can, that type of stuff can be done. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Okay. Um, Michael, you had a question for Mike. I do. 
So I've read what, what you've said, or maybe I heard you say it, I'm not quite sure, that under an ANCAP society, you would basically do away with the criminal law, and it would be handled by torts where criminals would have to pay fines. Uh, first of all, uh, my question is, how is that a deterrent when criminals aren't even deterred by the prospect of long prison sentence, let, let alone fines? And secondly, what if they just refuse to pay? If you don't have an, a, a, a final arbiter that's capable of seriously punishing them, why would they pay these fines, even assuming they could pay them? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, they would, they would just be forced to pay. All right. So, you know, so like the, the Victims Protection Agency would force them to pay. Um, and, you know, and, and if like if they don't have money, uh, I think it's OK to have labor camps, you know, forced labor. I think that's OK for criminals. Okay, now, um, oh yeah, you know, how, how is this a deterrent? Well, basically, so like, you know, as I, as I mentioned a little earlier, um, the things that we traditionally consider crimes are, uh, they're generally things where the benefit to the perpetrator is a lot less than the harm to the victim. Okay, and so if you, you commit a crime against somebody and you get whatever the benefit of that crime was, and then you're forced to pay compensation, you're going to be way behind, right? Because the harm that you caused was a lot more. So, I'd say, yeah, so typically you're a lot worse off. Um, the criminal might also be forced to pay uh, the cost of enforcement. Okay. And then, you know, uh, I'm also assuming that um, the private agencies are going to be more efficient at doing their job than government because, you know, that's generally true. So, but, there's going to be a higher probability of getting caught. But if it's merely a tort system, that's not, I mean, once you extend it and you say, okay, well, there's going to be forced labor camps, you're going beyond just civil law. Now you're saying that you're going to allow for basically prison sentences if they're in forced labor camps. And if you don't have anything beyond that forced labor camp and you're not going to secure them there, then they can always just go somewhere else. So I guess you, what you're saying is that it won't simply be torts well, and fines there's going to be the threat of some punishment beyond that well, well the um the distinction i wanted to make so like you know what they should do is order you to pay a certain amount and you know if you can get the money in some other way then you don't have to go to the labor camp right but if, if you can't and you refuse to pay then you go to the labor camp but the you know the, the point is the reason you're going to labor camp is so you can pay it's not because we're trying to make mm -hmm. you suffer because you're a bad person and you deserve it, right? Okay, so in prison, are you going to have something beyond the labor camp to threaten them with? Oh, um, no, I don't, I don't think so. But you know, but if you don't work, then you have to stay there. You have to stay there until you work off your, you know. Your so it's going to be like a prison, in essence. Yeah. So that right. Okay. So like, yeah, the incentive for working is so you can get out. Okay. So it, it occurs to me that there might be a few problems here for both sides, right? And that, um, and sorry, I'm not going to opine that I'm agreeing with either side here. It's just that, like, for the prison camp thing, I think, Mike, you might be respectfully overestimating the capabilities of some people who commit crimes that they that they will be doing, uh, you know, intricate work that pays the damages that they that they've caused. Um, yeah. But then on the other side of it, I also think that, like, if you're jailing people. But that's very costly. And once again, those people are, uh, uh, to be totally brutal and economic about it, a sunk cost most of the time. Um, mm. So I'm not sure how either side fixes that particular problem of essentially being judgment proof is what it is, whether you're uh, mm. it's a civil or a criminal situation. Um, do you got, uh, Maybe, Michael, I'll let you go mm. first if you want to comment on what I just said. And if otherwise, I'll turn it to Mike. Well, after. Uh, Yes. The, the only thing I would say is right now that the prospect of prison acts as a deterrent, not for everybody, but it does act for some. Had I not been in prison, I had no incentive to change. I wouldn't have cared. You, you know yeah. what I mean? But the, the prospect of being in prison and, and not getting out of prison <laughs> and, and maybe getting out and going back to prison compelled me to change. There's people out there that are on the margins that won't commit crimes because you have the threat of prison. If you do yeah. away with that threat, they're going to commit crimes. 
So th th that's what I'm th what I'm saying. Prisons are woefully inefficient and they do cost a lot of money. But I think that it, uh, under either scenario, whether it be ANCAP society or the one I, I want, if we're going to get rid of things like the war on drugs, you're going to significantly lower the, the prison population. Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, just like in, um, in the criminology literature, it's generally agreed that the more, um, the more important factor is probability of getting caught. So the, so the deterrent effect depends on the probability of your getting caught and it also mm -hmm. depends on the severity of the punishment, but it's generally agreed that it's mostly the probability of getting caught. And in the governmental system, your probability of getting caught is pretty low. And that's not just an accident of our particular society. There's systematic reasons why that's the case, because the government doesn't particularly have, they don't have the right incentives. In the anarcho-capitalist system, what would happen to you is less severe. You just have to pay some money. You don't have to go to this. If, if you can pay, then you don't have to go to the prison. But your probability of getting caught is higher uh, because you know the protection agencies have the right incentives. Okay, um, Mike, did you have another question for Michael or Michael? Uh, Mike, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start there. Mike, do you have another question? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't have no, to. It's, yeah. I, I have some other questions to ask anyway, too, that I, I wanted to ask at the outset of this. But uh, Michael, do you have another question to Mike before I ask a couple questions of my own? No, I'm uh, I'm okay with you. Uh, okay. Turning the question and asking over to you. All right, so... My first question is going to go to Mike. Um, now, I, I, just to, to maybe people have already divined this somehow, but I am more biased towards the anarcho-capitalist side than the minarchist side. Michael already knows this. You guys this. are teaming up on me? Yeah. The... <laughs> Actually, I've been making an effort to not do that. So <laughs> so I'm going to pick on Mike first. Um, and uh, so here's my biggest worry about my basically favorite political arrangement, which is that it might be not good or possible game theoretically, right? So you have a group of happy people who are getting along in a voluntary manner, and then they get just taken over by some warlike tribe. Um, and that seems to have happened at least once, maybe twice um, in history, although long ago, <laughs> mostly. Um, so I, I was wondering, and then just to, to cap that off, this is a related sort of question. People always make this game theoretic argument too that like, oh yes, these markets, they're wonderful. They do this and that, but it's all in the shadow of the state. And if the state wasn't there, it's just it's not going to work that well. Um, which it's not the exact same question, but they're related. What about the game theoretic viability of anarcho-capitalism? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, on, on the national defense, um, I mean, I have a chapter about this with you know, multiple arguments they don't really have time to go into. So I'll just mention a couple of things, right? So that, you know, one thing is, okay, so initially you think just like um, a priori sort of, you think, oh yeah, the government just has like this insuperable advantage, right? Because of their monopoly, they can just raise tons and tons of money to build a military and it doesn't have to be economically efficient either. And so, you know, they can go to war and they can lose like billions of dollars and then, but they still do it because politicians like, you know, whatever, okay. Um, and, you know, so on the face of it, you would think like a non-governmental force is not gonna be able to, de to defeat a government military. But in fact, that's not true because we have empirical evidence, right? There've been multiple times when extremely powerful government militaries were defeated by rebels carrying small arms, right? Like the US government was defeated in Vietnam by these rebels carrying small arms. And, uh, you know, the Soviets were defeated in Afghanistan. And then later, the US sort of like was sort of defeated in Afghanistan, right? And then like, you know, the French were defeated in Angola, and the British were defeated in Ireland. And these are the four most powerful, most militarily powerful nations in world history, right? Okay, so anyway, Another thing is, well, sometimes there are nonviolent resistance movements and this could be surprisingly effective. And again, if you're just thinking sort of like a priori and in game theoretic terms, you think nonviolent resistance. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that's obviously going to lose, but it has in fact worked, right? Okay, but, you know, the other thing I want to say is, well, so and anarchism isn't going to work just anywhere, you know, in any place at any time. We need to sort of have the right conditions for it. So it might be that you need the world to first become democratic before they can then transition to anarcho-capitalism. 
because uh, dictatorships are just a lot more warlike. Uh, but democracies tend to not, they, they tend to not, you know, do like these aggressive invasions because they're not popular. All right. So think about, you know, if you're just thinking in game theoretic terms, why isn't the United States taking over Canada? It seems like a, you know, a juicy morsel there. <laughs> like, it, well, we're not being stopped by the Canadian military. Sorry for any Canadian viewers out there. Uh, well, so military. I, I, I'm wearing a Boston Red Sox cap, but I am Canadian and I'm sitting in Ottawa right now, which is <laughs> okay. hypothetically where you'd go to take over Canada. Yeah, um, yeah. Sometimes I wish, you know, I'll leave that thought aside. Yeah. Um, but the, <laughs> yeah. What's stopping us is that it would be extremely unpopular with the voters. All right. So it might be that, you know, we fir you first transition to the whole world becomes democratic and then some society can become anarcho-capitalist. Michael, did you want to uh, respond to the question at all, too, or? Uh, just a little bit. And the problem is, in at least in the case of Vietnam, I don't know the other cases, is you, in addition to having the rebels, you also had a government. You had the North Vietnamese government that, that was backing yeah. the, the rebels. And also, the invasions still ha happened. Right. There's a massive amount of death that took place in, in all the places. The countries ended up losing, but they still misjudged their ability to win a war. And in, in a case where you had, you know, these protection agencies that were all standing, all that was standing between Vladimir Putin and a, and a lot of loot, I don't see him being deterred from going after them. I think that what deters him from c coming after the United States is our nuclear arsenal. And I think that that similarly deters us from going after him, but you don't have that when you have an anarcho-capitalist state. doesn't mean it necessarily will happen, but I do think that there's a significant risk of it happening. Right. Well, I mean, what's stopping us from taking over Canada? The, the beliefs of the population of the American people, which you okay. don't have that everywhere as yeah, is yeah. shown by the fact that countries invade other countries. Well, but, you know, that's why I was suggesting that, you know, we might have to transition to democracy. I mean, they, like the other states might have to become democratic first. You know. Okay, so I, I wanted to ask um, another question. Um, last one I gave to Mike, this one I'll go to Michael. Um, this is with respect to the claim that the government makes the law knowable. Um, well, there was an objection earlier. I don't remember which one of you raised it. Actually, it could have been either of you, because I'm sure you both agree about this, that legislation happens and it's just massive. And there's so much legislation. Practically speaking, the law is not really knowable in that sense because of the volume of it i i want to say also though that under the way the law works um theoretically speaking even just going by precedent or legislation uh because ultimately the legislation is going to be interpreted by a judge or judges um it's still not knowable right so you can you can try to guess what a judge is going to say and then the the less the government the less the question is political, I should say, the more knowable the answer will be, which was true for the entirety of common law. The less the king cared about the outcome, the more <laughs> knowable the outcome was going to be from the judges. So now we 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 do uh, exist in this state where like you have judges that are put in there under political uh, system, and they make highly political decisions that are not knowable beforehand and the last thing i'll say about it is like the general treatment of this when you go to law school or you you take a, a a law class um is people will say they'll use the words like we now know that xyz thing is illegal um or we've discovered that xyz thing is illegal and of course there's no discovery like that didn't exist before a few judges said it <laughs> but we will pretend like it was always illegal to keep up this sort of appearance that the law was knowable and everybody had, a, it was discoverable by everybody beforehand. Right. 
Now, I can see how an anarchist system would fix this with competing judges. I mean, first of all, you, they're not politically appointed. They're going to be appointed hypothetically. Assume Mike is right in talking about efficiencies and what customers want. You're going to find capable judges. You're going to find judges that don't waste time, that, that, that put forth their method of of judging these things first. And then people will sign contracts to be bound by these judgments later, fully knowing what this judge thinks and why they how they got there. Um, how does how because the, the judiciary is part of the night watchman state. All right. How do you overcome this problem where the law really isn't knowable? OK, um, the first thing I would say is that in the type of society I'm advocating, you're going to have far fewer laws. So they're far easier to know. But even in the society in which we currently live, I know murder, rape, and robbery are illegal. I know that selling heroin, crack cocaine, cocaine are all illegal. I know what the speed limit is. I know there's copyright protections and patent protections. So there are a significant amount of things that I do know, even in such a complex uh, legal system that we already have. So I think that the the most important behaviors are certainly knowable and known by most people. And in a minarchist society, the laws would be far less. So I think they'd be far easier to find out. Now, as far as you get back to the same thing, as far as how to stop the state from growing, uh, and I would say it's the same principle as how would you implement an anarchist society? You've got to convince enough people that are going to care enough about the stuff to make it happen. Yeah, I I just want to I don't want to argue uh, with you. I just want to make no, sure that can, the, the question you can gets, argue if you want. No, I don't. I really don't want to because I'm supposed to be the mediator, the the it's moderator okay. here. Okay. Um, but I just want to make sure. I, I think what I'm pointing to isn't uh, the volume of the laws or or that sort of thing. But it it's just like it, in your system, presumably, even without the state growing, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the judges would be appointed by some kind of political process still. Mm -hmm. And so my just. Just focusing in on whether the law is knowable, I guess, is what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. So do, do yeah. you have well, like... A, yeah. Well, ultimately, like I said, we do know a significant amount of the laws. People generally... I, I did 25 years in prison. I don't think I've ever met a single person who was in prison for committing a crime they didn't know was against the law. They knew what they were doing was against the law. So people generally do know the laws. But in the case that you're talking about, okay, so judges get appointed by political actors, by politicians, right? Well, those politicians are elected by people. So if people have a philosophical change, then the types of people that they're going to elect are going to be different. The incentives that elected officials are going to have are going to be different because they're going to be responding to a different type of policy population. So the types of judges they're going to appoint, I would say, are going to be different. There is no panacea. There, there's there's no such thing as perfect under the sun. What the, My whole spiel at the beginning was that we're talking about what is best going to protect individual rights, make individual rights secure. If we're looking for, you know, where there's not going to be any flaws anywhere, then I, I just, we're barking up the wrong tree when you're dealing with human beings. All right. Thanks. Uh, Mike, did you want to throw anything into that uh, question or conversation? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, most of the time people know what the law is. All right. So like with the most, most of the law violations, right, that you care about, um, and people already, already knew, obviously, like, you know, you're not supposed to steal stuff. Though I think that there could be cases where it's sort of like a business doesn't know the regulations, Right. Um, but also it might be that so it might be that they're violating the law and not knowing it, but also they might just get away with it. Right? OK, but it's sort of like there's some unpredictability because the regulations governing businesses are so complicated that, you don't, you know, and then and then you don't know if you're going to get in trouble. Right. So, like, you know, that's a problem. But, you know, and then obviously we would we would agree that there should be a lot less regulation. Yeah. Um, you know, but what I want to say is, yeah, but the the excess regulation the explanation of that is not simply people have a bad philosophy. It's that there are incentives to produce it. Right. So that, you know, like there are, there are incentives to lobby the government to get regulations that favor you as opposed to other people to, to give advantages to your business and disadvantages to your competitors. There's just incentives to do that. It's not, it's not just a matter of people having gone philosophy. 
Well, the, the businesses that lobby for a regulation, uh, you know, say say you're a bank and you want a specific regulation because you're already have a competitive advantage. The bank might have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of voting power. The reason that their lobbying is able to get politicians to do it is because people are convinced that they're being screwed by the free market system. They're being screwed by banks. If you look at the, you know, the crash in 2008, uh, for instance, where everyone, not everyone, but a significant amount of the pu public said, oh, my God, this shows that capitalism doesn't work. It showed no such thing. The, the crash was caused by an abundance of laws that were previously passed by a Federal Reserve that was artificially manipulating interest rates. But the public didn't understand that. But a philosophical change would get them to understand mm -hmm. that. So even if you had, you know, the incentive for some business to push for it, for a given regulation, if the population already understood that those regulations were bad, you wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, so I just think like sometimes finding out that regulation is bad is too cognitively demanding for normal people. And so, and, and like, it's not that they couldn't find out, it's that it would take them sure. time and then they don't have the incentive to put in the time. But do you think that people could have the incentive to understand, for instance, that regulatory agencies are no good? Because that's where you get most mm -hmm. of your regulations from. They're not passed through legislation. So you wouldn't have to show them each regulation is bad. You just show them that the agencies themselves are bad and get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's feasible. But um, like some regulations are actually good. <laughs> so and like and it, like it it requires research to find out which ones are good. Okay, so <laughs> and my favorite example is uh, I, I don't know how much agreement there will be among the returns, but anyway, banning CFCs, fluorofluorocarbons, which were destroying the ozone layer, and was going to cause like you know lots of cancer <laughs> in future generations. So I'm just assuming that that's true. <laughs> okay, then that was a good regulation, right? And so you know the point being like, well, you don't want to just get rid of all regulations. So then that means that somebody has to decide what are the good regulations and what are the bad ones, right? Um, uh, you know, I guess this is, you know, I, I realize that, you know, you'd probably say, well, but this is a worse problem for anarcho-capitalism because <laughs> they, they wouldn't ban it, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> right? there's no central government. Um, yeah, okay, there, so I, th I think there's some things that are just problematic and it gets back to the, if we're looking for utopia, we're not going to find it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I'm not going to step in here because I don't want to be accused of anything in the comments. So I'm going <laughs> to um, I will then turn this over to uh, Michael for your closing statement. OK, uh, I, I think I've already said what I wanted to say on the subject. So my closing statement, I just Jerry, you did a great <laughs> job moderating. And it, Mike, I think you were you, you were a great uh, opponent in this debate. It's been very uh, cordial. It, it, great discussion and again thank you both for participating all right good mike you got anything you wanted to say uh well you know i, I would echo that you know except thanking you two rather than thanking myself <laughs> makes sense uh, you know, this, is, this is a good fun conversation um i want to just i want to just look at my notes and see if there were things i didn't respond to that i meant to oh uh you know so what's the difference between a homeowners association and a government okay so i you know like there's a particular neighborhood and maybe there would be laws for that neighborhood because there'd be a, a local homeowners association. So why isn't that just like a government only small? And okay, well, I mean, there, it doesn't matter. You know, semantics doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you call this anarchism or government, but what matters is there are important differences between that and our current system, like the traditional kind of governments that we have, right? So first of all, coercion versus voluntariness. So uh, you would have you would have a literal contract with your HOA, unlike the social contract that we have with the government, which is not a contract, right? <laughs> which is just like, you know, where they just impute to you agreement, right? You would actually literally sign a contract to join the HOA. And then and the other important difference is there's meaningful competition. So um, you might think that there's some competition between governments because you could move to another country. Right, but there's not much competition because it's super difficult and expensive, right? Because you have to like leave behind your family and friends and your job, and you, know, you might have to learn a new language, just like that. Like it's it's just hard to move to another country, but it's not that hard to move to another neighborhood within the same country, and so for that reason, the competition between different homeowners associations is more meaningful. 
right? And then that, that prevents them from abusing you as much as a national government can abuse you and, and get away with it, right? Um, okay, other things I wanted to talk about? Oh, um, yeah, why is anarcho-capitalism more realistic? Yeah, so, you know, and Michael had pointed out that, well, we have to have a philosophical change to get either a minimal state or anarchy. Um, but the, the point that I want to push is that the anarcho-capitalist society doesn't require people to act against their interests. Okay, and so now, you know, I, I know that um, a bunch of um, followers of Ayn Rand would say that stealing stuff isn't in your interest anyway, even if you can get away with it. Um, but let me just say, I mean, narrow self-interest, right? Self-interest in the way that sort of like a lot of ordinary people think of it and the way that criminals think about it. Um, the the anarcho-capitalist system doesn't require you to give up narrow, you're following your narrow self-interest. Okay, so we would probably have to have a philosophical change in order to get the thing to come about, right? Although like there are some proposals that people have about where it could come about just from economic incentives. So, you know, what if you just get some libertarians together in some area and they start like a charter city or, you know, they start one of these um, floating cities in the ocean or something like that. And then people just see that it's working out really well, right? And then people might join for, you know, economic incentives rather than philosophical change. So, like, it's not totally infeasible or, you know, not crazy that that could happen. Okay, but anyway, like, even you know, you don't, in addition to changing people's philosophy, have to ha have to get people to act against their narrow self-interest. So, like, that's why it's supposed to be more feasible. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that was, that was all I wanted to say. Okay. I, you know, I, I got, I'm sorry, Mike, I have to do this. Michael, do you want it to do over? Do you want to say a couple things and then we'll call it a day? Keep it short. <laughs> I'll keep it. I'll keep it real short. Okay. Uh, if if you're defining self interest in such a way as I'm getting stuff from the government, well, then you would have to get people to go against their narrow self interest because they'd have to do away with the current system in order to get to anarcho capitalism. As this, things currently go, they're getting benefits from their government. They're getting handouts, and they would have to give them up in order to go into an anarchist society. Okay. All right, Mike. I know, I know, I know. You want to say something back? No, but but let's. Yeah, let's not. Let's. I want to thank you guys so much for for doing this. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so you can find this on both Michael's uh podcast and my podcast, and hopefully you go to both of them if you really like both of us, just to give us both the algorithmic help. So, <laughs> all right. Um, thank you very much, and have a good day.